Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, welcome back to another episode of New Books in Japanese Studies, a podcast channel of the New Books Network. I am Jenny Lee from the University of Arizona. Joining us today is Dr. Aika Exter and his new book, Comics and the Origins of Manga, a Revisionist History. It was published by Rutgers University Press this year. Um, Aika is currently an independent scholar based in California. So this book is a thorough study of the evolution of Japanese manga under the influence of Euro-American comics, and more importantly, how closely they're linked. Well, welcome, Aika. Thank you so much for joining us today on the channel. Thank you so much for having me. So can I assume you read a lot of manga? I actually don't read that many modern manga, which a lot of people are surprised by when I tell them that. Um, I I do read my fair share, but probably not as much as uh, people might expect from the fact that I've devoted several years of my life to uh, studying the history of manga. Um, I have read a lot of pre-war manga, um, but yeah, not a lot of contemporary stuff. That's interesting. So what prompted you to write a whole book on the history of manga? I've always been interested in manga and comics as an art form. So my PhD training was in comparative literature. So I've always been interested in in different forms of narrative. And I'd always wondered why manga and comics, so like European and American comics, right, and Japanese manga, uh, basically look so similar, right? They function in very similar ways. Their their narrative and formal structures are essentially the same, despite some stylistic differences. Um, And all of the histories of manga that I read basically portrayed manga as sort of this, the product of this gradual evolution from medieval picture scrolls or even earlier forms of art. And so I was really interested in that question. And originally I I hadn't set out to write about the history of manga specifically. Uh, originally I was interested more in questions of translation. And I'd, I'd learned from Frederick Schott's book, Manga Manga, about the existence of these American comic strips in pre-World War II era Japan. And I thought that was really interesting that, you know, like almost a uh, hundred years, well, actually like a hundred years ago that people in Japan were reading these American comic strips. And I thought from the perspective of translation that that was a very interesting topic. So it was only when I started looking at these comic strips more closely and looking for more of them that I realized how many of them were there were in Japanese publications at the time. And also, and perhaps even more importantly, how much closer those comic strips looked, those foreign comic strips looked to modern manga than uh, did a lot of the works that were published, written by Japanese authors at the time. Fascinating. So in this book, how do you define manga and what are some of the features? Because uh, th- that was one question I had when, first start- when I first started reading the book is... Um, I, I kept thinking of the current day Japanese manga, say the ones on Shonen Jump. And I thought it, it sounded a bit different from what uh, your book was describing. So I wondered if you have a more um, specific definition of what you call manga in the context of your book. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And that's a I think a huge problem in the historiography of manga is that the term is often left undefined. And the reason why that's a problem is that the word actually has meant all these different things. So before the word anime, for example, became widely adopted in Japan, anime was just called manga, right? But when today people say manga and are talking about manga, they're they're not talking about anime, right? They're usually talking about comics specifically. And then, of course, you have the Hokusai manga. So during Hokusai's time, the word manga actually meant something very different. And a lot of times the this connection of the word itself, so the fact that Hox, the Hokusai manga and also works by other artists at the time were called manga, um, a lot of his, his stories of manga try to portray that as sort of a connection between modern manga and works 
by artists such as Hokusai. But the word manga actually went through a transformation in meaning. So there is no actual connection between Hokusai's works and modern manga. So one of the things that my book addresses is how the word manga actually came to describe comics primarily. And of course, the, the word manga, even when it when it started to describe comics, it also meant graphic narrative more broadly, such as picture stories, which were more text heavy. Um, so the way I, I define, I, I make a distinction in the book between picture stories and what I call audiovisual comics, which I think is basically synonymous with comics, but because people define the the term comics in much more expansive ways. I'm trying to distinguish it from that. So basically by audiovisual comics, I mean this, this uh, narrative form that essentially developed in the United States in the late 1890s in response to technologies like the phonograph, uh, photography, and film. So with the appearance of these technologies that could capture motion and sound, you see the appearance of first pantomime cartoons, these multi-panel cartoons that uh, essentially depict something without having to narrate it, right? You see these short stories, usually four panels, sometimes more, and sometimes less, sometimes only three panels, or even two, that depict sort of these, these brief vin vignettes um, without needing narratorial explanation, which was a huge difference compared to previous works of narrative. So if you're familiar with the, the picture stories in Europe, for example, by, by um, artists such as Rudolf Tepfer or Wilhelm Busch, um, those were very text heavy. So you always had an external narrator explaining what was going on and the images kind of illustrated that story rather than narrating it primarily. So when you look at most of the works, in sort of the early to mid 1800s in Europe and then also the United States and, and also Japan and other countries um, that were also influenced by this tradition uh, that was spreading with sort of colonialism and the, the sort of the spread of Europe, your American culture around the globe. Um, the, the innovation basically of pantomime cartoons where something was just shown to you as opposed to narrated, then later enabled the creation of what I call audiovisual comics where the audio component was added. So with the spread of the phonograph and sound recording technology, uh, cartoonists in the United States uh, try to depict sort of this new experience of being able to hear recorded voices, which of course had never been able, uh, uh, you, you never had been able to, to hear that in the entirety of human existence. And of course, to us today, right, it's completely natural that we hear a voice and there's no person there, right? We hear, we listen to the radio, we watch a YouTube video. But at the time, that was a crazy experience for people to, to hear a voice. And, and you see that reflected in cartoons and in, in, in European cartoons, American cartoons, Japanese cartoons at the time, where, for example, one of the, the Japanese manga, one of the earliest sort of audiovisual comic strips actually features an old man listening to the radio and he says, oh, it's almost soon they're going to have people jumping out of that horn, right? It was really, for people, it was really this insane experience that there was a voice, but not a person. And so around 1900, in the, the late 1890s, American cartoonists made jokes about this. So almost all of the cartoons that featured some kind of sound were about this experience of hearing voices without having a person there. And so gradually these jokes uh, led to the, the incorporation of sound as a regular element into works of graphic narrative. And so that is essentially how modern comics, so the, the basics of modern comics, right? Where you, you don't need a narrator to explain what's going on. You just have characters actually addressing each other, talking to each other directly. And so that developed in the United States and then exploded in popularity. Like today, it's, it's kind of hard for us to imagine because comics, um, well, now there's this resurgence, of course, because of superhero comics, but comics and comic strips were basically one of the two major forms of entertainment for people in, in the early 1900s. 
And this form of narrative then spread all over the world, wherever sort of the same technological innovations were becoming popular, right? Where people were watching movies and listening to phonograph or gramophone records. That's also where comics then became popular because it was sort of the similar experience, right? Where you consumed something that was mimetic, even though, of course, the, the writings on the page, it was still as though these characters were actually talking to one another. So it was kind of like watching a movie or like listening to the radio. And so this form then is introduced to Japan in the 1920s, um, even though there had been some, some earlier uh, introductions that had not quite caught on. It's only in the 1920s when this form is introduced to Japan and it's just massively popular, maybe more so. Uh, the same thing happened in, in, like I said, in many countries around the world, but there are few or perhaps no countries outside of the United States where this form catches on as it did in Japan. And basically that established the, the basic form of modern manga. That is so interesting. Is this what um, is uh, what you refer to as graphic narrative in the book? So I use the term graphic narrative as sort of a catch-all term, the way that some scholars use comics as basically a synonym for sequential art. So some people, um, David Kunzley, for example, or Scott McCloud, right, talk about comics as something that um, basically encompasses everything where you have multiple images that narrate or help narrate or illustrate a story. And because I'm using the term comics more specifically as audiovisual comics, because that is, I think, the way most people use the term today. So that's why I'm using the term graphic narrative as sort of this, this catch-all, this all-encompassing term to describe both picture stories and audiovisual comics or anything that uses images to narrate or help narrate or even illustrate a story. That's um, fascinating. And I was wondering, so because I'm an early modernist, And I'm sure you've heard the story of how people connect uh, modern day manga to early modern Japanese um, picture books or even painting scrolls, like the famous one from the pre-modern, from the medieval period, which is kind of like a non-narrative drawings only, but with minimal uh, textual description of birds and animals. Um, A lot of people think that's the beginning of Japanese manga. Yeah. But would you consider uh, graphic narrative as one of the features that kind of debunk this conception? So that's that's a really interesting question because, yes, so the you're talking about the Choju Giga, right? The the scrolls of what is it? The scrolls of frolicking animals is usually how it's translated into English. And I love the Choji Giga. The Choji Giga is great. I mean, I they while I was living in Japan, they showed it at the Tokyo National Museum. And you have to wait in three hours in line to see the actual thing. Um, and then you you had to very slowly walk past it while the security guards were hushing everybody, shushing every uh, no hush, um, <laughs> hurrying everybody along to make sure that that the line wouldn't be much longer than three hours. And then uh, they actually split the thing into two parts. So if you wanted to see the second half, you had to come back and again, wait in line for three hours, which I did. So I've spent like 10 hours of my life to to look at the Choju Giga in total. Um, And uh, it is a wonderful piece of art. And it's, it's, the style is very timeless, which I think is partly why people are so quick to connect that to modern manga, because it really looks like something you could draw today, and it would still be be seen as something that is that is current, contemporary, essentially. Um, and well, let me let me start in a different way. So the the theory that the Choju Giga is an early manga that was actually started in 1924 by a manga artist who sort of wrote the first book length attempt at a history of manga. And uh, even he said that there's no, there's no actual like linear connection between the Choju Giga and other forms of art that he considers manga. Uh, But after him, basically every subsequent or almost all subsequent histories made that claim. And then of course, 
for you have people like Tezuka Osamu, for example, who have then actually also incorporates a scene from the Chojigiga into his manga, which then even makes it look even more like there's a connection. I mean, there is a connection, but it's sort of retroactive, right? It's people in modern times looking at the Chojigiga and calling it a manga, but there's nothing, there's no line essentially that you can trace from the Chojigiga, right? It's not like there are these picture scrolls, then gradually incorporated speech balloons or something like that, right? And I'm always very frustrated with these histories of manga that essentially go Choju Giga and then Hokusai manga and then Tezuka Osamu as though there's like this, this kind of tr transition between those three. But there's really, there's no transition from the Choju Giga to like Hokusai's manga. And then, as I already mentioned before, there's no sort of linear connection between the Hokusai manga and modern manga either. Uh, so it is that, yeah, that, that is a, a somewhat frustrating aspect of a lot of manga historiography. But even so, it's it's not just me that's that's claiming this out of nowhere. Even the, the curator of the exhibition, of the Chojigiga exhibition, uh, in the, the exhibition catalog actually wrote an article about whether the Choju Giga is a manga or not. And he very clearly says no. He says there, there's absolutely no connection. And actually looking at the Choju Giga as a manga and, or trying to see it that way may actually lessen your appreciation of it because that's simply not what it was. And if you look at it as a manga, you're basically not accepting it on its own terms. And I think that's, that's a very valid uh, point. Well, thank you for saying that. I would definitely bring what you said to my students and show them how they should not be connecting the dots this way. <laughs> now, to return to modern Japanese manga, um, I'm curious. So you mentioned um, as early as uh, 1924, there were, there were already manga. Um, when they first appeared, I guess when they first picked up pace um, as a part of popular culture, what forms did they usually take? Like what platforms were they published on? And who were the main audience? Oh, that, so that's a great question. Um, so earlier I mentioned how the, the term manga sort of changed in meaning, right? So the, the word manga starts appearing in the late 1700s in writing and various Japanese texts and usually refers to, uh, so I, I translate it as sketches. Um, they're not always, I mean, they're essentially line drawings, which also, of course, uh, enables um the the this uh thesis or the proposition that this is connected to modern manga because of japan's long tradition of, of line art right as opposed to for example european painting oil paintings right you you sort of you you paint areas and that creates a figure whereas in line drawing you draw the outline of something and japan has a very long tradition of line art going back to the choji again even before that so that that makes it very easy to to see to look at something like the Choju Giga or the Hokusai Manga and think, oh, this looks kind of similar, right? Because it's all line art, and this long and rich tradition of line art may very well be uh, have been a huge factor in why Japanese audiences were so receptive to cartooning and comics. But so this term in the the late 1700s and early 1800s men sort of these kind of sketches it was probably used kind of um self-deprecatorily it was like this is not like super great art right it's like a, a loose sketch and there's a whole uh etymology behind the word manga that may go back to the chinese name of a bird that sort of used its beak to sort of draw lines on the water in sort of more or less random ways uh, that's sort of the only real etymology that that has been proposed for for the word manga, but it doesn't have sort of this. Often it's translated as like whimsical pictures or something like that, right? But it never had sort of this this essential meaning. It was probably a word that that was picked up in some way. It it meant something that was sort of like rough, like sketches or out like line art. And so it's really only in the 1890s then when a cartoonist by the name of Imaizumi Ippyo, uh, who actually went to San Francisco to study cartooning. So he was trained or at least wanted to be trained as a, as a cartoonist in, in sort of American styles. 
And he wasn't successful. People rejected him supposedly because he wasn't familiar enough with American culture uh, to basically draw cartoons that would be funny to American audiences. But he brings back a, a whole bunch of cartoons from American newspapers. And then he starts working for the Gigi Shimpo, which was uh, run by um, Fukuzawa Yukichi, this huge, important figure in, in the modernization of Japan, who was his uncle. So with a little bit of nepotism, he finds this job at this newspaper and uh, he starts publishing these cartoons that he had brought with him from the United States in this newspaper. And these cartoons uh, include um, like pantomime cartoons, uh, what I've mentioned before, these silent cartoons that just depict something through images alone. Imaizumi then starts publishing these American cartoons, and he actually starts using the word manga, which up to that point had been mostly describing sort of these these images, this this line art by Hoxha and other artists, that was that was never narrative, by the way, which often people forget because there are panels in a lot of the Hoxha manga, but they're not, they never tell a narrative. So Imaizumi then uses the word manga to describe these foreign cartoons and also cartoons that he draws himself based on this model. Um, and the very first time that he actually uses the word manga in this sense is actually with a foreign cartoon. And it's literally, it literally says above the cartoon, manga excerpted from a foreign newspaper, which probably comes as a shock to a lot of people who always, who read these these manga histories, right, that start with the Choju Giga and how the, how modern manga is such a, a traditional, essential Japanese art form, that actually the beginnings of the modern word manga, right, in the sense of sort of sequential art and graphic narrative, uh, it, it actually started with a foreign cartoon. And so um, that's how the, the word, the meaning of the word manga is, starts to change. And then at the same newspaper, Imaizumi is succeeded by Kitazawa Rakuten, who became uh, one of the most famous Japanese cartoonists of all time, who also was trained in Western cartooning uh, by an Australian artist and who then starts uh, a, a cartoon magazine called the Tokyo Puck and who succeeds Imaizumi at the Gigi Shimpo. And Kitazawa sort of inherits the, the word manga from Imaizumi and keeps using it for uh, cartoons that are published in the Gigi Shimpo and starts this, originally it's just a section of the newspaper called Gigi Manga, and then that turns into a whole supplement. And it is with the success of the supplement that so the, the word manga becomes more common in this new meaning of describing cartoons, both narrative cartoons, also single panel cartoons, such as just caricatures of politicians and stuff like that. And so that's basically where the history of modern manga starts, right? The, the history of manga is describing narrative art. So that only starts in the 1890s. And sort of the, the entire history before that, right, the Choju Giga, the Hokusai manga and stuff like that, there's, there's no connection between all of that and then the, the, these cartoons that are imported from abroad, essentially, and labeled as manga. So that's kind of where, where that all starts. And then, uh, and you also have influence by um, European cartoonists. So Japan was not, at that point, isolated from the world at all and was eagerly importing um, a lot of foreign culture, I mean, especially from Europe and the United States. and. Uh, so manga essentially then develops this sort of this this broad field that has a variety of meanings still, like caricature, right, political cartoons, and picture stories. And Kitazawa actually uh, followed American cartooning and American comic strips, which start to proliferate around 1900 fairly closely. And so you start seeing a lot of these elements then in manga that first appeared in American cartooning, such as uh, pain stars, for example, right? So these, these like stars that show whether when a character is hit on the head and stuff like that, that then already begins to show up in Japan fairly early. And Kitazawa, as early as uh, 1908, actually publishes a translation of an American comic strip in his magazine, Tokyo Puck, and also writes picture stories himself that are based on, uh, on an American comic strip. 
And so the from the very beginning, right, you have this this strong influence from abroad that then is incorporated sort of into the the Japanese publishing landscape in in newspapers and magazines. That's so interesting to hear because nowadays Japan exports so so many manga works every year, and it's basically a cultural icon of Japan. So when Japan first started importing these works from European European countries and America. Um, which is a major point that you uh, make in the book is the close connection between Japanese manga and those from uh, Euro American culture. So, what um, changes did Japanese manga artists have to make to adapt to a Japanese audience? That's a yeah, that's a very fascinating question. So. Um, basically, up to the 1920s, right when manga sort of starts to, to flourish as sort of a, the the broader field of cartooning, and you have people writing these or drawing these um, single panel cartoons and multi panel cartoons, and then the 1920s, 1923 to be precise, is when so the the floodgates break open and you have this rush of publications that eagerly import uh, foreign comic strips, especially American ones. When uh, a tabloid newspaper called the Asahi Graph uh, starts publishing George McManus's comic strip, Bringing Up Father, and that becomes a huge sensation. And uh, what was really amazing to me when I started researching this is that Bringing Up Father was actually the longest running manga in Japanese history up until World War II. And that that is a fact that for some reason is just omitted from all manga histories. And uh, even on the part of, of Japanese scholars who are generally more familiar with um, with the pre-war history of manga, or at least a lot of Japanese histories of manga are more detailed in that regard. Bring of Father is often portrayed as something that was introduced, but not introduced in the sense of imported, but as sh- shokai sareru, like something that is a sort of showcase, as though the Asahi Graph is like, look, look at this, this comic that Americans are reading. But it was hugely popular in Japan, and you find ads featuring the characters. There was there was a stage play, so people were and and the ads are found everywhere, basically in, in all newspapers, whether they featured the strip or not. So based on that, is evident that basically in the 1920s, almost every Japanese person knew of this comic strip. And again, it was the longest running manga, and it was called a manga too. So it was these a lot of these strips said Gai Koku manga, so like foreign manga or America or Bay Koku manga, so like American manga. And uh, so because Bring Out Father was so popular, all of these other Japanese publications then rushed to, to also have an American comic strip because Bring Out Father was so popular. And the popularity of these strips, of course, then induces uh, editors to tell their Japanese artists and their Japanese cartoonists, hey, draw something like this. I want something like this. Because, of course, it's much easier if you draw something right there in Japanese, because then you don't have to translate it, right? You don't have to actually ship something from the United States to Japan, like look for uh, other publications from which you can copy these strips. You don't have to worry about licensing if it's an in-house cartoonist doing that. So that's basically how this this new form of what I call audiovisual comics, where characters talk to each other using speech balloons and you see motion through like motion lines and these paint stars to show all of these things that ordinarily in a still image you wouldn't be able to see, such as sound and pain and motion. Fascinating. And over the years, uh, as Japanese manga became so influential, do you think any of these um, audiovisual format that's um, more adapted to the Japanese audience have any influence back onto American comics? Yeah, so of, of course, as everybody knows, right today, Japanese manga globally are bigger. The, the Japanese manga industry is much bigger than its American counterpart these days, and um, that the prime primary reason for that, I think, is that whereas in the United States in the 1950s you had a big anti-comics movement where there were even congressional hearings. Uh, but the the threat that comics pose to American youth that like horror comics 
were leading children to become criminals. Batman and Robin were turning children gay. Like all of these these outrageous claims um, were made in this moral panic that kind of mirrors what today, or at least a couple of years ago, we went through with video games, right? Whenever there's a new medium that is uh, consumed by children as well as adults, you have this moral panic where people start to worry about what, what influence this might have, what pernicious influence this could have. And so in the United States, this anti-comics movement is quite successful. And uh, comics up until the 40s were basically very rich in content and there was they were very diverse. But then because of the comics code, which the comics industry adapts to prevent official censorship, you, you have basically uh, blood and crime and sex and drugs, all of that becomes taboo. So that disappears from comics, which basically means that it's very hard to tell the more mature stories using comics. And so that's why American comics then becomes mostly superheroes, right? Because in superhero stories, no one ever bleeds, right? No one ever dies. So they're, they're very sort of censorship friendly. And then you have, of course have Disney, right? Cartoon animals, because the same is true there. There's, there's very little violence. There's no sex or drugs in, in Disney comics, but in Japan, uh, there were some anti-comics movements, but they were far less successful. So in Japan, after World War II, uh, you have this explosion in manga, especially, of course, with the, the success of, of Tezuka and Samu and also Hasegawa Machiko's um, Sazae-san that uh, sort of lead comics to, to prosper and flourish in Japan in ways that... Uh, basically were completely curtailed in the United States due to the anti-comics movement. So it's really in the 1950s when comics in Japan begin to overtake American comics. And that's then why starting in the, in the late 1970s and then the early 1980s, when sort of American comics artists and audiences begin to discover Japanese manga. And of course, at that point, the, the close connection between the two, right, that originally they were actually the same thing, that the, the most successful manga in pre-war Japan were essentially American comic strips. And that that's kind of the, 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 what I would say, the main origins of modern manga. That history at that point has been completely forgotten. And because manga have changed in some ways, stylistically, they then appear as this foreign thing to American and, and other audiences around the world. And because manga at that point have become so much more diverse than comics in other countries, uh, and, and then also more commercially successful, right? Over the course of the 90s and the 2000s with like Sailor Moon and Dragon Ball and then Naruto and stuff like that, that uh, comics artists in other countries start adopting stylistic influences from manga so the 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 direction of influence completely inverts right whereas originally japan was eagerly taking in all of the elements of american comics and now it's american comics where so the the eyes start getting bigger right and like the the facial shapes are more simplified and sort of american artists uh mainstream artists are often trying to make their their works look more like japanese manga that is um very um how do I say ironic in a way um we we see Japanese manga being influenced by American manga early on and now it's completely reversed, but it also as this process that your book um shows that demonstrates um there is this sort of romanticize romanticization of manga um we are trying to, or at least, um, I guess, Japan, Japanese cultural lovers, um, and Japan, maybe the Japanese government in the core Japan project, are trying to elevate manga to a status of um, representative Japanese culture or a cultural icon, um, or even traditional art, as the uh, case of Choju Giga shows. So how do you reconcile with this narrative and what's really behind the blooming of manga? Yes, yeah, so the embrace of manga as part of the Cool Japan initiative is kind of ironic because originally in uh, the 1930s, 
the the militaristic the the military government of Japan was very skeptical of manga because it was essentially a foreign form, right? It was the the foreign origins of manga, the primarily American origins of of manga at the time had not been forgotten yet, and so everything. And of course, there were already plenty of diplomatic tensions between Japan and the United States at that point. And of course, the military was generally wary of foreign influence. So uh, beginning in the 1930s, you sort of see this, this skepticism towards towards comics in Japan. And then in uh, 1936, the government actually uh, enacts an ordinance that that regulates what sort of ch- stories and, and media that are aimed at children should look like. And then actually, um, of course, then when Japan enters the Pacific War against the United States, uh, you see uh, comics almost disappear for a while. So especially speech balloons, which I think were most emblematic of this new medium, um, the government kind of preferred this more traditional picture story form that was kind of seen as less modern and less foreign. Uh, but then, of course, now that manga are this this huge booming industry, and once people in other countries started seeing manga as something interesting and eagerly consuming it, the the Japanese government uh, embraced it as something that could actually bolster the image of Japan abroad. Um, but at the same time, sort of then emphasize the the origins of manga, something specific, specifically Japanese, right? Because if you're using comics as something to to boost the Japan's image overseas, it's then very tempting to also say that this is something that is inherently Japanese, right? This is not just a variant of this universal art form. This is something that's specifically Japanese, that's traditionally Japanese. And that's also when the government starts teaching this connection between modern manga and Hoksa and the Chuju Giga to middle school children. And there are curricular guidelines enacted by the Ministry of Education in Japan that specifically mention these picture scrolls and then manga by artists such as Hokusai as early forms of manga. So this is actually that is something that is now taught in school to Japanese people. So it's very hard, which is part of the reason why I why the, the subtitle of my book is a revisionist history, because a the way that the history is portrayed is revisionist in that it seeks to sort of eradicate uh, from history, the the actual process by which modern manga developed, and sort of substitute this what I think is a mostly misleading history of, of these ancient origins of manga, something that's developed over hundreds of years. But then also, of course, my book is trying to revise that official history. Um, yeah, did I did I get off track? Did that answer your question? No, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, we see these revisions of history going on everywhere, and it's just um funny that it's happening to manga when um when we have scholars of say pre-modern Japanese literature trying to cut ties between the between Chojugiga and manga, whereas official history textbooks are trying to reconnect them. Yeah, I, I already <laughs> I, I got I, I already got bashed on Twitter by um a group of Japanese right wingers who discovered my book and then said it was anti-Japanese and it's not, I just want to reassure anyone who's listening that my book is not anti-Japanese at all. And I think I don't understand. I mean, so I, I understand the eagerness of portraying manga as something that's inherently Japanese, right? There is a strong incentive for the government to do that. If you're a nationalist, there's a strong incentive to do that. If you're a scholar of Japan, there's an incentive to do that because if Japanese comics are just one form of comics, right? Then you also have to learn about the history and you study manga. You also have to learn about the history of comics in general. But if you see it as something that's purely Japanese, you don't, and if that is your main field of research or your main interest, then by seeing manga as something that's specifically Japanese, you don't have to deal with all of this other non-Japanese stuff, which is, I think, essential to actually understanding the the history of manga. But I did already get some pushback, not only from uh, the group of right-wingers on Twitter, but also uh, an early peer reviewer actually just completely hated 
the idea of my book and just flat out said Japanese manga deserve to be treated on their own, which I think is an interesting approach to take to an art form. I, I don't think art forms inherently are deserving uh, of, of particular treatment, but that's a different question. Yeah. Well, I hope our listeners don't take this book the wrong way. I found it interesting myself, so I hope um, other people do as well. Oh, thank you. But, I, mean, yeah. I do think it's it's an incredible success story. I mean, it shows the, how immensely creative Japanese artists were. And I think it's a, it's really fascinating. I think great that even already 100 years ago, right, this was a global culture. I mean, of course, the 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 direction of influence was fairly one-sided, but um, I think it is fascinating that people in so many different countries were reading and, and sort of looking at the same materials and laughing about the same jokes. I think that's a, from sort of a, a humanist perspective, I think that's a very encouraging story. Yes, definitely. Well, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful conversation. I sure learned a lot about manga. Thank you so much for having me. And for our listeners to learn more about the history of manga and its connection with uh, Euro-American manga, make sure you check out this book, Comics and the Origins of Manga, A Revisionist History by Dr. Aika Exner. This is Jingyi from New Books in Japanese Studies. Until our next episode, goodbye. <laughs>